Welcome to the Warriors of Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. Warriors of Grace is about helping men from generation to generation become gospel men in private, in the home, in the church, and in public through the Word of God. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome back to the Warriors of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today, I'm going to be uh, today we're going to be joined by Parker Reardon. Parker is, has a doctorate of ministry uh, from the Word of Life Bible Institute. He's also gone to the Master's Seminary, where he uh, served at Grace Community Church with John MacArthur. Uh, he's been serving in ministry uh, for over 20 years. He's happily married to his beautiful wife, Cynthia, for 25 years. The Lord has graciously given them bookends of girls with five boys between them. He currently also serves as a counselor and discipler at Sovereign Grace uh, Biblical Counseling. He lives in Southern Oregon, uh, where he serves as the pastor at Grace Bible Church Talent and also as an adjunct professor um, at Midwestern Seminary Teaching Biblical Counseling. I also have the privilege of helping Pastor or Pastor Parker preach uh, once uh, every other month or so at his church. Um, and I'm so thankful for that opportunity. You guys are going to be blessed uh, by him. Uh, so I, without further ado, welcome my friend Parker Reardon. All right, for our study tonight, we want to... Uh... Look at a subject on fighting for purity in a porn-saturated age. I've been in the ministry for about 30 years now, and uh, as a pastor, uh, there's been a number of times to come alongside men and women in regards to this topic. When Sovereign Grace Biblical Counseling and Discipleship got started, I could not believe that it seemed like the majority of counseling cases coming in were dealing with sexual sin issues, bringing to my own mind years ago at another church when it seemed like I was getting all the sexual sin cases of our church and I asked the other pastor that hired me, is this going to be the lot to my ministry the rest of life? And I did not know how prophetic that question was when I posed it so many years ago. So I wanted to spend a little time tonight orienting our thinking about this issue. We live in an unprecedented time of pornographic images and sexually explicit material that's more readily available than any other time in redemptive history. Now we understand as we study the Bible and we can go back to the Old Testament, David, the man after God's God's own heart, attests to the lurid members of his eyes that help the sinful, lustful heart sin. He was on his housetop when he ought not be, doing what he ought not to be doing. But you fast forward a few thousand years, and you stroll through the malls, you notice the billboards if you're in the city, clue into the retail catalogs that are in our mailboxes, The ads, if you have a smart TV, it doesn't matter what app you're using. If you're using the freebies, uh, the free apps, Hulu or one of those other ones, they've got advertisements. And sex sells anything from suntan lotion to cars to virtually anything the sales industry wants to make appealing as it convinces you of what you need, what you want, what you desire, and what you crave. Just like the children of Israel in the wilderness who were craving after the leeks and garlic in Egypt land. What'd you do, Lord? Bring us out here in the wilderness to kill us? It was so much better. And No, actually it wasn't, if they were telling the truth. It was horrible in bondage. Well, though they might boast in their spreadsheets of the worldwide sex industry of $57 billion, or the U.S. $12 billion, they don't want to admit and own up to the real price tag of pornography, of the marriages that are destroyed, the pastors that are shamed, 
and the victims we hear on the news every day if you can actually stomach the daily news. Before we open our Bibles, if figures and studies are even remotely accurate, it ought to do more than just drop our jaw and put a pit in our stomach. It ought to kick us in the pants to action, seeking for our own soul sanctification as we walk in the path of righteousness and blessing and call others into fellowship and to rescue people who are in this downward, downward spiral in smut and sin. Notice some of the uh, studies show that over 28,000 users are watching pornography every second. One out of five mobile searches are for that very subject matter. Now I'm going to try not to step up on my soapbox of how I loathe the smartphone. Yeah, it accomplishes a lot of beneficial stuff. I remember years ago when I was contracting, I could look up where the closest um, supply store was at to get some more supplies for jobs I was doing. But what has been used for good has been used for a lot more evil. So again, I'm trying not to step up on my soapbox against smartphones that's become such a device for sordid purposes because it it makes temptation and sin that much more accessible doesn't make the human heart any more sinful it just it's easier to sin i'm grateful for resources to help in our war against sexual sin one particular resource as i've been trying to people come my way and we start dealing with sexual sin issues and many times these are people who are not consistently in the word so they're not on sheath and the sword of the spirit to wage war with their flesh and so we got to get them in there in a consistent daily devotional exercise and so uh deep park reju had uh i think he was the is the managing editor to Presbyterian and Reform Publishers 31 Day Devotionals, and this particular one that he wrote, Pornography Fighting for Purity. Well, I'd run across a little article that uh, was posted on the Biblical Counseling Coalition. Uh, I think it's a four pager on how to dumb down your smartphone. We're, wait, we're, we're readying ourselves for our own sinful weaknesses. And if you find that this device is helping you in your sin, maybe it's time to dumb it down and go back to the flip phone if you even continue to have a cell phone. Whatever it takes to gouge out the eye or to cut off the appendage that helps us dishonor Jesus and pursue our own sin. According to Covenant Eyes, a uh, helpful resource that uh, we, uh, when our family members get a smartphone, they automatically sign up for Covenant Eyes. We don't allow smartphones in our house to be used without at least some protection and no matter what protection you use, they're not foolproof. They're just a tool. There's always back doors as a way to get around them. But if you're just trying to honor Jesus and keep away from that stuff. Anyways, Covenant Eyes says 90 to 96% of young adults and teenagers are either accepting or neutral when talking about pornography with their friends. Think about that. Almost everyone is either neutral or accepting. Where are the godly young men and women with a spine and a healthy fear of God that's been driven in, into their soul so that they're standing against, they're saying no, and they're even graciously confronting as warriors of light in the land of darkness? Friends, this is what God's called us to. Not only seeing our own soul sanctified, but coming alongside our young people to help them wage war. If they come to faith in Christ... Their identity, like ours, is we are salt to hold back the corruption of our society. We are light and we to shine brightly as we speak the truth in love with these issues. You know, this age group believes that not recycling is worse than viewing porn. Think of how, how backwards that is. You know, you know, in the church house, one in five youth pastors, one in seven senior pastors use this fleshly tool on a regular basis. Now, I'm not sure how the data was accumulated in these studies, but that's 50,000 U.S. church leaders. Well, let's think about this. These are the ones who are at least open, humble, and honest enough to answer the questions. Think about all those that are still hush-hush and secret. It's got to be far worse. And again, I'm not trying to scare us. I'm trying to ready us in our soberness. 64%. 
of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they watch it at least once a month. Notice how we included women in this. Lest you think that pornography and sexual sin is only a guy thing, Years and years ago, it was hardly an issue, according to, as I talked to some other biblical counselors who are females, but this is growing rampantly, regardless of what gender you are. In 2018, a study revealed 57% of teens are searching it out at least monthly. 51% of male students and 32% of female first viewed pornography before they were even a teenager. On average, among men, it's 12 years old. I've talked to some brothers who it was several years earlier than that. And 71% hide their online behavior from parents because this particular sin thrives in secrecy and cover-up. Parents, grandparents, this lesson is for you, not just for those that are dabbling in it. God has called us to ready warriors to assault this dark age with the light of the gospel and pure lives that have been set free from their sin. Proverbs 28, 13 says that he who covers his sins will not prosper. Matter of fact, coming from the lips of God himself and his word, prosperity does not come as we pander to our flesh, but whoever confesses and forsakes their sins is mercy. So let's help God's people learn to uncover their sin to their heavenly father that he might cover it with the blood of his son. Take your Bibles, if you would, and run with me over to 1 Corinthians 10. There's so many passages that I'd love to, to turn to tonight, but uh, we don't have time to, we're just going to kind of scratch the, the surface. Now, again, I didn't show those stats to shock or to scare, but to help in our endeavor to live soberly in this present age as Wicked and dark as these perilous days are, where men are lovers of pleasure over lovers of God. That's what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 4. I've already alluded to how Jesus identified his followers as salt and light. So we're to expose sin, hold back corruption of society. To say that is to say this, let's be reminded, in spite of the smut of sinfulness, the power of the gospel is greater than our desire to please ourselves. Isn't that not good news? Isn't that not life-altering, earth-shattering? To those who have been redeemed, they've got a new aim. It's to please the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. It's a desire to glorify Him over self. If you memorize 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or everywhere in between, do all to the glory of God. But that's not where we're going. 1 Corinthians 10 now let's wander down through some of these verses for a moment. Notice verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation. How many temptations? Paul says none. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. If you have not memorized that verse, let me encourage you. This is your homework assignment this week. I could give you several other verses. This is a great starting point. Man's been fighting his fleshly sins ever since Genesis 3. Man's been doing what man's been doing ever since the beginning. And yet, Paul, by inspiration of the Spirit of God, tells us that every resource has been provided to glorify Christ. We're lacking nothing. Through the indwelling power of the Spirit and the Word of God, we can do battle with the sinful flesh and our wicked hearts. It's common to man. In other words, there is, there's no such thing as a Superman temptation, as if those urges cannot be overcome through the power of the indwelling spirit. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Either John is truthful and the word of God is inerrant. Man's always been tempted in the world system by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2.16. Go back to Jesus' temptation in your mind. The Spirit of God, according to Mark's presentation of the wilderness, the Spirit of God compelled or flung the Son of God into the wilderness. Front and center comes the Son of God to manifest His power over the darkness. And He was tempted always like as we are, says the writer of Hebrews, yet with what? Without sin. He was tempted with the lust of the eyes, 
lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every time he opposed Satan's temptation, he responds with the word of God, again revealing to us that the word of God is not lacking in anything. It's totally sufficient. Peter gets at that in uh, 2 Peter 1. We've got a sufficient Savior and the sufficient scriptures. So here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. There's the commonness. Common thread is that man is always being tempted. Been tempted in every aspect. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. So let's put away our excuses of I just can't. With the temptation, he'll provide the way of escape if we're willing and humble to glorify him rather than glorify self. You know, when we're at the... Uh, the why in the road. Do I glorify self or glorify God? God promises me he's given every resource needful. I'm going to go God's way. It's the hard way. Pander into the flesh is the easy way. I've been doing it all my life. And yet the glory of God and even our Christian testimony is at stake. Lift your eyes up to verse 8 for a moment. You know, in, uh, actually in uh, verse, verse number seven, set in the context, Paul's looking back at the Old Testament saints. He says, don't be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Verse eight, nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. <laughs> Learn from them. We get to kind of choose how much pain we want to go through life. You know, those woodshed events that are promised in Hebrews 12 to all of God's leg legitimate children. Learn from their consequences because we don't have to mirror the same passing pleasure of sin for a season and get the, the sordid consequences that are difficult. You know, when, when Solomon's writing the book of Proverbs, he holds himself up to his son as the poster child of what not to do. Look at dear old dad who multiplied wives like God told him not to do. And God told me if I did this, they'd draw my heart away. And that's exactly what they did. So chapters five, six, and seven, all about sexual purity as he talks to his son. Don't be like your dad. Don't think that you have to experience the fame and the fortune and the females to be taken down. Take it from my experience. That's what Paul's doing here as he looks back in 1 Corinthians 10 to the Old Testament patriarchs. Notice verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. You've heard me say before when I'm preaching and teaching that uh, we ought to be keenly suspect of our own sanctification, should we not? We kind of think that we're uh, down the path of righteousness about this far. And then uh, we just get humming in the Christian life, and then you get married, and then you get a, a spouse for a lifetime that reminds you that you're not God's gift of, since sliced bread, right? You're not quite as holy as you are in your own mind. And then he adds kids, and we, then we desperately see our depravity. You join the local church, you identify with a local assembly, you commit to them, and there's accountability there where they keep our feet to the fire, amen, so that we're not living in a delusion no different in the church at Corinth when Paul's reminding them, don't be all high and mighty in your own minds thinking that you cannot fall for sexual sin issues. If you don't think that you could fall for sexual sin, whether it be pornography or premarital sex or extramarital effect, uh, sex, any kind of sexual sin, then you're stronger than Samson. You're godly than David, who was identified as a man after God's own heart. And you're wiser than Solomon, who was endowed personally with wisdom directly by God like no other person. If you think you stand, take heed, Paul says, lest you fall. Don't be too big for your own britches. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, prowls about seeking whom he can destroy. So we've, all, we've got our own... Totally depraved hearts, our sinful, fleshly propensities within us, and then we got the tempter outside of us. You know, that promise that we looked at in verse 13, notice how it uh, follows in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from, flee from idolatry. Flee from your sexual idol. Flee from sin to holiness where there are pleasures forevermore. This is living by faith. You know, and how the Bible tells us of the empty lies of the flesh, the empty lies of Satan, 
rather than by feeling and passion. What was he whispering to Mama Eve's ear in the garden? Has God really said, you know, God's holding back all the goodies. Look at these prohibitions all around you. No, God had said in the Garden of Eden of the whole thing you might freely eat, save one. This is the lavish, overflowing goodness of God, even in his provision for our good and for his glory. That those mild posts that are firmly planted keep on getting moved, flee from sin rather than indulging the flesh. I wish we had time to have a little study in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 8. Jot that down for your devotional time this week. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. Paul says to the saints at Thessalonica, abstain from sexual immorality. And he, he spells it out in black and white. This is the will of God. You want to know what God wants of you, child of God? This is God's will, your sanctification. And then he goes and puts his finger right on that you avoid sexual immorality. Possess your vessel in honor, he says. How are we doing in our thought life? Are we memorizing and meditating on the thought list in Philippians 4.8, dwelling on that which is true and that which is praiseworthy? Because smut's not praiseworthy. It's all a fantasy world, a delusion. It's not true. So again, Paul says to the Thessalonians, abstain from sexual immorality, possess your vessel in honor, not like the Gentiles who don't know God. You know better. You've got a Christian biblical worldview. You've made it your aim to please the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. They're still slaves to their sin. They're obeying their lusts rather than the fruit of the Spirit's working of self-control. That's what the Spirit works in the believer. So that we possess our vessel. This is progressive sanctification that we're called to. It's biblical purity. Something that must be learned and grown into. So if we need to learn a, a biblical sexual ethic of purity, what would that look like? Glad you asked. Some biblical principles for starters. To minister some gospel hope, to strengthen with the word of God through the power of the Spirit, to wage battle for the glory of God, and to help others in this rescue effort. Now again, this is not exhaustive, but I think it's enough to show you the sufficiency and authority and power of the word to answer and to provide. Notice, first of all, learn to admit. These are all with a letter A, so that we can commit these to memory. Admit. Take full responsibility. 1 John 1, 8 to 10 is referenced there where we're learning how to confess our sins as believers. It's part of our prayer life. It's an element in our daily worship to the Lord. So I trust you get ready for corporate worship this Sunday. We're having the Lord's table, and then daily worship is still part of our worship. We're not seeking to hide our sin anymore. We're bringing our sin to God, taking full responsibility. Because our sinful bent is to blame shift. You know, it's somebody else's fault or to minimize it. But we're learning how to own it all, knowing that this is the way to spiritual prosperity. This is the way to God's mercy. There's prosperity and mercy to be had doing life God's way. Well-known church leader John MacArthur put it this way. He said, repentance needs to be as loud as the sin was. Don't settle for the worldly sorrow, sorrow of the world rather than godly sorrow and real biblical repentance. Admit it. Take full responsibility. No minimizing, no blame shifting. In other words, it's not about saving face or impressing others with how uber pious we are, but uncovering in sincerity to God that he might cover and soliciting the help of godly friends. More on that aspect in a moment. I was telling one brother today, it's easier to avoid temptation than to resist it. Think about what Paul said to the Corinthians. If any man thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. Don't even put yourself in a position. Don't get as close to the cliff as you can without falling off. Stay as far away as possible. Because it's easier to avoid temptation than to resist it. You look at what Solomon tells us in Proverbs. Every man that the strange woman of Proverbs took down were strong men. And if in gospel humility we recognize that we are the weaklings that God's called to himself, insufficient, inadequate left to ourselves, so that the arm of flesh is going to fail us every time, Galatians 5 teaches us. But through the power of the Spirit, there can be the Spirit's fruit. 
So we're seeking to even restructure life so that we're not in those situations. You know, take the, take the person who says, but I need my computer. It's my job. It's what I do for work. I've got to bring home the bacon to pay the mortgage. Well, that's, that's fine and good if, that's, if you're not offering an excuse and you'll use that computer at the dining room table so your wife and kids can walk by, your back's not against the wall, and they can look at the screen anytime. That's what repentance looks like. That's what humility looks like. No cover up. Matter of fact, she also ought to have the passcode to your smartphone. Maybe even you need to reroute your way home so that you're not going by the girly shops or the billboards and any other place that it's easy to succumb to the pothole sins of our lives. Stop the deception. Stop the lies. Stop the cover-up. Stop the excuses. Man up. Be a man or woman of God. Admit. Take full responsibility. Number two, accept. Because you bought into a lie. Now, all those Proverbs references I gave you next to this point are about learning from the reproofs of life. This is a humble teachability. Fulfillment comes only from God. Otherwise, we haven't denied self. When we're still being passion or feeling driven rather than principle or truth driven, only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or self. Put on humility. Put on teachability. Recognize that you can't handle but need God's help. You know, Usually people don't come to biblical counselors until they're bleeding profusely, figuratively speaking. Crisis mode. Just lost my wife and my job over this sinful, seductive cinema. Well, even getting found out is a gift from God if you're going to get right, because otherwise they wouldn't come for biblical counseling. Admit, taking full responsibility, except because you bought into a lie. You know, there's an old Southern gospel song that talks about how that sin will take you further than you want to go when you thought that you'd stop right back here. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. That's the deception that often man is bought into, bought into a lie. So admit, accept. Number three, alter. We're coming to the new year. Is it Saturday? Is New Year's Day? Lots of New Year's resolutions. Going to go exercise and lose some pounds. I'm going to change my eating. Going to read through the Bible. You know what? I'm going to give up this sin. Doesn't work that way. No matter how sincere your resolve is, no man just stops sinning. Because we're habitual creatures. We do what we do. We do what we've been doing. We seek to put off or replace sinful habits with righteous habits. When I've been going my way, glorifying self and the flesh, I'm learning how to go God's way, which is the hard way. Over in Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead dead to immorality, dead to impurity, dead to passion, dead to evil desire and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Give up your idols. Replace those idols with Christ, in whom is all fulfillment and satisfaction. Settling for anything else is an idol. You know, when we are, when, when I say that we're habitual creatures, we start our habits right out of the womb. womb. If stomach's empty, empty we whine. Diaper needs changing, we whine, and we continue whining until somebody asks us if we want some cheese with our wine. (laughs) So we are habitual creatures. We start early on in life, and we've been doing things so wrong. And then you come to Christ, and we're learning how to dehabituate and rehabituate to the glory of God from a heart level. You know, we, we learn right out of the womb, to justify self and to rationalize our sin. We continue to do life the way we're doing it. We're oblivious to those potholes. we got blinders on. We're learning not just to put off sinful habits and replace them with righteous ones, but in Ephesians 4, there's also that renewal of mind, which is in Romans 12 as well. 
We're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of our minds, where we learn to think biblically and godly about the issues of life, whatever they are. We're not going to act different until we think different. We win and lose the battle in our mind. You see, sexual sin is not a biological issue. It's a soul issue. It's a heart issue. The corrupt heart. Corrupt mind that strategizes on its bed how to commit iniquity so that we're learning how to grow in our fear of the Lord so there's greater fear of God in our heart. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we want to alter our life, restructure it for godliness, progressive sanctification. You know, we didn't get to Galatians, did we? Galatians 5, verse 16, But I say, walk in the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What a promise. Walk, lock, step, and barrel with the Spirit of God who reveals himself, in the, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit... You're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, notice these, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. You know, all, the, all the carousing, verse 21, verse 20, 22. But, here's the contrast, the fruit of the Spirit. What does the Spirit work through the gospel of God's grace in the regenerate heart? Well, he works out love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's why Paul was learning how to buffet his body and make it his slave. He's no longer a slave to his sin. Neither are we. We're slaves of righteousness, slaves of King Jesus. Those that belong to Christ, verse 24, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. War on, baby. We're on with the flesh within. We're on with the tempter outside of us. You know, number four was alleviate. We must become so desperate to honor Christ in the inner man, sick of dishonoring our Savior. You know, in 2 Samuel 11, 2, we're told in the narrative about David that he saw that Bathsheba was beautiful. There's those eyes. He didn't have a smartphone. She's beautiful. And he was more captivated by that than he was the Lord. She's beautiful. He's not. And the whole kingdom suffered. That's why Job says in Job 31.1, he starts with his thoughts. I made a covenant with my eyes. How could I look upon a virgin? Can't even look. Because then there's going to be the double take. And it flips the trigger of lust in my sinful heart. Make that covenant. We need to learn how to biblically talk to ourselves in the moment, to take that half a step back, to evaluate that slow-moving train wreck, that if at that moment we do not change course, we're going to dishonor Jesus. Take God's word by faith that these fleshly feelings are liars screaming at us, pleasure, no, it's pain. Ask David, ask Solomon, ask Samson. We must actively change course. Let me throw a John Owen at you. One of his well-known sayings is that you must be killing sin. That's presently. That's actively. You must be killing sin or sin will be killing you. There is no neutral ground. There is no just being passive, just getting by. You're either seeking to radically kill sin Take, taking radical measures to love Jesus, willing to gouge out an eye, cut off a hand, or any tool that helps us sinfully pleasure self because it's going to wreck our fellowship with him. Is he growing in preciousness to you? How could we sin against him with the thorn-crowned brow who set his love upon me, the chief of sinners? Grow in your love for Jesus and you'll grow in your hatred for indwelling sin. That sinful craving, that bite of the forbidden fruit being replaced with the pearl of great price. Jesus is the treasure in the field that you sell all to buy. And number five, accountability. Do you have some deep gospel friendships to call into action in your corner? Think of the first ultimate accountability partner before you think on a horizontal plane. Think vertically. Think about God who is you know, the omni-God. He is, he's everywhere. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's with us everywhere. Lust is a liar. It's temporal. Dwell upon Christ's glory, your Christian testimony, your family, your church. Everything's at stake. 
with sexual sin. So think of your ultimate accountability partner, but think also of your gospel friendships, those that help shake us into reality. We cannot oversell the importance of a healthy local church to belong to. Huge tool of sanctification. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes that a cord of three strings is not easily broken. So that when you fall, you've got one to hold you up. That's why James talks about confessing our trespasses to one another. Why, why do we do that with deep gospel friends? Because they can pray with us and for us. So when the Spirit of God triggers their memory banks during the week, they know exactly what to assault heaven on as we learn to put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. It sure is harder to pander to the flesh when we're actively involved in each other's lives, stirring each other to love and good deeds. We only scratch the surface, beloved. Don't have time to get into all the, the heart issues, the misplaced worship that comes from there. When in, in Mark 7, 15 to 23, Jesus diagnoses where every evil thought, all fornications, acts of sexual immorality and adulteries come from, it comes from the sinful heart within. So that it's not just the lustful deeds, but man has a lustful heart. Let me send you with some, you know, your, your last slide has some helpful resources. Notice the first one, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me, as you learn to sing in Sunday school, right? Nothing substitutes for, nor has the power like God's living and active word, which gets down to the crevices of the heart, according to Hebrews 4. Memorize it so that you've got trigger verses. The Spirit of God can blow the cobwebs off and use it for conviction in life. Meditate on it. Study salient passages that we didn't even have time for tonight. Grab a copy of Dr. Street's Passions of the Heart, Biblical Counsel for Stubborn Sexual Sins. John's a, a seasoned biblical counselor and professor of biblical counseling. This book was produced a couple of years ago after decades of pastoral ministry and study. Uh, so many features about his book I, I love. I haven't been trained under him. Uh, he doesn't use the addiction light language and label like a lot of people. It's sinful enslavement. He uses Bible labels. Bible labels have hope that I'm not a, a person is not a, a victim, nor are they a sexual addict. There's no hope in those labels. There's hope in the gospel for life change. You're not a lifelong sex addict. Get Heath Lambert's finally free. He used to be the executive director of ACBC. He doesn't follow the man-centered self-help focus of so many others, but points to our glorious Christ and the hope that's found in the gospel and the gospel alone. Fighting for purity with the power of grace. Check out the little hardback, Randy Alcorn's The Purity Principle. While there are a couple of minor warning flags, I think it ought to be assigned reading in every home of every young person. As they learn to value biblical purity and the gift of virginity that God has made them a steward of. That little help booklet at the bottom of your slide, help, he's struggling with pornography by Brian, Brian Croft. Why do I keep good biblical counseling booklets? Because you show somebody a full-size book and sometimes the panic button is pushed. I don't read. Well, you better learn to read. Get some good biblical resources. You know, this coming Lord's Day, we're going to meet around the Lord's table. The sermon's going to be from Psalm 32, blessed are the forgiven. We're going to breathe some some gospel fresh air. You know, if David had fled, like Paul commands, flee immorality, he wouldn't have gotten in such a mess. He wouldn't have destroyed another, another family, not to mention the nation that he was king over by the grace of God, and even the death of his own beloved but illegitimate son. He testifies that God forgave, and yet God did not take away the consequences because what a man sows, says Galatians 5, that shall he also reap. If he just followed his own examples throughout the Psalms of how to seek the Lord as our rock, the Lord is our refuge, he's our deliverer, he's our satisfaction, he's our fulfillment. He's the prize of all prizes. C.S. Lewis affirmed the truth, quote, All that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, Prostitution, classes, empire, slavery is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which can make him happy. Or as Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes, all that we chase after in life is vanity if God is not at the helm of life's ship. 
Early church father Augustine of Hippo said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Don't settle for the lies of porn. Go to the book of all books that reveals the face of Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would purify us to be a holy people that put you on display before a watching world. And as you make us more like Jesus, help us not only to have our own soul sanctified, but to be used as faithful servants in a rescue effort for fellow believers struggling in sin and needing to know the gospel. The Bible has all the answers that Jesus has given us everything needed for life and godliness through his spirit and his word. Release us to do your will. Use us as faithful witnesses for Christ. We pray in his mighty name and for his sake. Amen. Well, guys, I hope that that episode was really helpful. I, I thought it was really well done. I'm so thankful to Parker for my friend for joining us on the Warriors of Grace podcast. I'm excited about this series, uh, Dangers to Intimacy with God and One Spouse. I trust that you're finding it helpful. And uh, thank you for listening or watching this episode. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Warriors of Grace podcast. If you enjoyed the show today, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you want to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or search Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find our show on the front page of the website, servantsofgrace.org.